For the next two sessions, we're going to talk about preventing and resolving virus infections. We're going to start with vaccines, which is a way that ahead of time you can protect yourself from being infected. They are probably the best defense against virus infection. Of course, we don't have a vaccine for every virus infection, but for those uh, that we do have them, they're the best defense. They use, of course, your immune system to prevent infections. They depend on memory. And importantly, they, bake, they break the chain of infections of virus going from one person to another. And this is a graph of longevity, life expectancy in humans from about 1900 to uh, past 2000. And you can see in the 1900s, you could, you could expect to live about 50 years. And now you can expect to live between 70 and 80 years, depending on your gender. And no doubt, a good part of this longevity increase is public health measures, sanitation, uh, antimicrobials, antivirals, and vaccines. So, and of course, having health care available to more people, not just people in big cities. So vaccines are a big part of this. If you took them away, we would see a downtick in this curve. In fact, this downtick in life expectancy in 1918, anybody know what, was that, what that was from? Spanish influenza killed many, many millions of people. And now we presumably can prevent this from happening in the future with vaccines. Now you have seen this slide before. It is a generalized version of an immune response, either antibody or T cell response. After seeing an infection or an antigen for the first time, you get an initial immune response, right, which takes a week or two to develop. And then you have, for a long period of time, protective immunity. The, the levels of antibodies and T cells are, are very low. But if you then encounter the pathogen, again, you have a rapid immune response, which we call memory. This is what vaccines do. They tap into memory without giving you the initial disease associated with the first infection. First vaccine that we acknowledge against viruses developed by Jenner in 1796. He noticed that milkmaids, women who milked cows, never got smallpox. Smallpox was a big deal back then. Uh, in, a U in the UK and, an event, and also in the colonies. He noticed milkmaids never got smallpox. They got something called cowpox, where they got rashes on their skin, and they seemed to be protected. Now, he didn't know smallpox was caused by a virus, because remember, 1796 is before, it's 100 years before virus discovery. But he thought there was some kind of uh, infection going on, and he did an experiment where he took a young boy and he inoculated him with uh, material from a pustule from a, a cowpox on the hand of a milkmaid and then two weeks later he challenged him with smallpox virus and the boy lived now he waited two weeks which was very bright of him right because that's about the time you need to get a response to a vaccine if he had waited perhaps a week it would have failed and who knows it might have taken many more years to develop vaccines today we no longer immunize against smallpox. The, Jenner's initial observations were parlayed into a smallpox vaccine, which was used to eradicate infection in the 1970s. And for many years, uh, you would get immunized against smallpox with a bifurcated needle with a little drop of vaccine in it. It was used to scratch your outer layer of skin where the virus replicates well, and you would get immunity. And many of us who lived in the pre-eradication era have smallpox scars on our arms. You can see them up here. And you go to a pool or a beach, you look at the older people, they all have smallpox scars. Some of them are big because the virus caused a little local reaction. In 1885, Pasteur made a rabies vaccine. Um, he had no idea it was a virus. He knew about infectious diseases and he made a rabies vaccine uh, and he called, vac he called this vaccination in honor of Jenner and his work on cowpox, because that's a Latin word for cow. And in the 1930s, then, we started uh, developing more seriously vi viral vaccines, yellow fever, influenza, and so forth. And we'll talk about some of these today. Now, this is when the anti-vax lunacy begins, right after Jenner. Here's a woodcut from his time called The Cowpox Were the Wonderful Effects of the New Inoculation. And people thought if they got Jenner's vaccine, they would grow cow parts from their arms. So, you know, today we have anti-vaccine lunacy and it began all the way back here. Me vaccines, 
given in large global campaigns, have been very successful at preventing infections. You've seen some of these curves already on the upper left. The incidence of poliomyelitis in the US, 20 to 30,000 paralytic cases a year, uh, eradicated from most of the world today by the use of two different vaccines, which we'll talk about today, an inactivated and an oral vaccine. Measles on the bottom, we've also seen this. Many cases of measles in the US associated with deaths and that has been almost eliminated in the U.S. But again, measles vaccine is one of the vaccines targeted by the anti-vaccine lunatics. So they don't immunize their kids and they get measles and it continues to spread. On the upper, on the right graph is a graph showing you the number of measles deaths that have been prevented by vaccination. So the top curve uh, are the estimated measles deaths from 2000 to 2012. Uh, which would have occurred in the absence of vaccination. We're looking at millions here globally on the y-axis, between 1.2 and 1.6 million deaths. On the bottom are the number of actual deaths uh, with measles vaccination. And these, the bars in between are the estimated deaths prevented. So many, many millions of deaths prevented by this single vaccine. Vaccines are now part of our existence. They're part of basic health care. In many countries, we immunize children, we even immunize adults, we immunize our pets, and we immunize wild animals against rabies by dropping vaccine-laced bait into the forest. Many childhood diseases are rare. Growing up, I, uh, I was lucky to have a polio vaccine in 1955, but we always got measles, we got mumps, we got rubella, we got chicken pox. All my friends had these illnesses now uh, nobody has them anymore because of vaccination. Unfortunately, this is a first world development. Third world countries still don't immunize enough. We talked about how measles vaccine isn't properly distributed and there's still many, many cases of measles globally. There's a rubella vaccine. Rubella is associated with birth defects, much like Zika virus. You can prevent them all, but there are still 15 to 20,000 cases of children born every year with congenital rubella syndrome because they don't get the vaccine. And this is an issue of cost and distribution and so forth. Now, how vaccines work is you have to maintain a certain level of immunity in the population. You never have to immunize everybody. So that's the key. And, and how many uh, have to be immunized, we'll see in a moment. But this whole concept of immunizing a fraction of the population is called herd immunity. It has nothing to do with cows or, or sheep or any animal that lives in a herd, okay? It has to do with protecting the whole population with a few. So the idea here is that virus spread stops when uh, the probability of transmission reaches below a certain threshold. To get tra to, if you're talking about a virus transmitted from person to person, you have to have enough susceptible individuals, you have to have people excreting the virus, and by just immunizing a fraction of the population, you can stop the spread. And the threshold is virus and population specific. For example, in certain populations, you need to have 80 to 85 percent of people immune to smallpox to stop its spread. Measles is higher. It's a more infectious virus that has a higher R naught, the number of individuals which can be infected by one infected individual. So you need to have a very high percentage of the population immunized. This is why when we have pockets of anti-vaccine lunacy and uh, places like certain places in California where lots of people don't immunize their kids at once, you have outbreaks of measles. The kicker here is that no vaccine is 100% effective. No vaccine, if given to 100 people, will cause there to be protective immunity in all of those 100 people. And that's, that's again, a uh, property of both the virus and the population. So here's an example of, of these numbers on the bottom with a measles vaccine. If you give 80% uh, of the population measles vaccine, 70%, 76% end up getting immune. So 4% do not respond for whatever reason. Now, the problem here is that we don't check people to see if they've responded to a vaccine. When you get your childhood vaccines, you get them, you get two or three doses, whatever the course is, and that's it. You go home and you hope for the best. But if we did check individual people, we would find not everyone's immune. We could go back and re-immunize them. That might take care of the problem, but that's extremely costly and we don't do that. Now, vaccines have to be accepted by the public. Even though we require certain numbers of vaccinations to get into school, you can get around it in many states. You can just say, I have a medical or a religious objection, and you can go to school 
and uh, not be vaccinated, which isn't fair to the other kids who are uh, vaccinated. But anyway, there's a long list of things that people say about vaccines, which uh, makes them fail. Large scale vaccination programs depend on people taking vaccines. And these are some of the phrases I have heard over the years, why people don't want to get vaccines. But again, none of them make any sense. None of them are actually true. I know a guy who got the flu shot and then got the flu. Well, yes, if you get the flu shot and then three days later you get the flu, that makes sense, right? Because you don't have time to mount an antibody response. But of course, the flu shot itself will not cause uh, influenza. So f continuing on this idea that we have to have public acceptance of vaccines in order for them to be successful, here are some examples of outbreaks of measles in a variety of groups. So there are lots of religious group associated outbreaks as shown here. The senior pastor of a church in Texas had been critical of measles vaccination. So, you know, his people listened to him. They didn't get their kids vaccinated. And there was an outbreak of measles. What the hell is a priest talking about measles vaccine for? <laughs> Doctors and scientists are supposed to advise you about measles vaccine. 23 cases in a unvaccinated Hare Krishna community in North Carolina. 58 uh, cases in Brooklyn in an Orthodox Jewish community. And this goes on and on with different <laughs> vaccines as well. And then, of course, the yellow ones are measles cases in communities where parents decide they don't want to give their kids measles vaccine. How do they decide this? I have no idea because the, the vaccine is safe and it prevents measles. Go figure. Big outbreak in California. These parents, not only they don't immunize their kids, but they send them to Disney World and they infect other kids. And of course, people go to Disney World from all over the country. So many of these yellow state outbreaks of measles started at Disneyland in California. Thanks vaccine, anti-vaccine lunatics for starting uh, that outbreak. All right, first question. Herd immunity demonstrates the importance of immunizing livestock. B emphasizes that not everyone must be immune to protect a population. C emphasizes that everyone must be immune to protect a population. D describes how groupthink can dominate anti-vaccine choices. And E, all of the above. Okay, most of you got B, which is correct, e emphasizes that not everyone must be immune to protect the population. And I will assume that the 3% who got the opposite were just confused because the opposite obviously, you don't have to uh, have everyone immune. That's the whole point of herd immunity. Now, as you know, we've, we've discussed this before when we talked about adaptive responses. We have uh, what we call active and passive immunity. And vaccines can be the same thing. Active is when you give someone a pathogen, a modified form of the pathogen. You make an immune response, uh, and now you have memory and you're resistant to disease. Passive is when you give someone the products of an immune response. And right now, the only passive vaccines we have are antibodies. And uh, the most, one of the well-known ones is rabies, which you can buy. Um, so these are antibodies that have been purified from individuals who are volunteers and they are immunized with rabies vaccine. And if someone is bitten by a rabid animal or a suspected rabid animal, you get a vaccine, you have time to actually be immunized before the virus gets to your CNS. And in, in the same time, uh, you are injected with antibody to rabies virus at the site of the bite to neutralize any infectious virus that can be present. So rabies is one of those virus infections where you have time to immunize someone after they have bitten. So, you know, if you suspect that it was a rabid animal, sometimes they will try and get the animal and see. But if you can't, you assume it is rabid, uh, and then you get the course of uh, rabies vaccine. Now, this is, at the moment, a polyclonal serum pr uh, purified from people, but a monoclonal has now been uh, put on the market. When you're born, you acquire antibodies from your mother. We've shown this before. As you develop in utero, uh, through the placenta, IgG is transferred. Uh, and at birth, you have a nice complement of IgG. So you, you reflect your mother's infection experience. So whatever she has had, you were protected against. And then you, do, you begin to develop your own immune system comprising IgM and IgG. By about a year of age, you're on your own. And the mother's antibody declines uh, in about nine months. So that's a natural passive vaccine. ZMAP is perhaps the best known passive vaccine. It was very famously written about in newspapers during the Ebola epidemic. This was an experimental vaccine made by a small company in San Diego. They took 
virus-like particles, they, so they didn't have to grow Ebola viruses, which is a BSL-4 pathogen. They just took the glycoprotein. Uh, they made virus-like particles, which means there's no genome in them. They're not infectious. They immunized mice with these. They then identified monoclonal antibodies against uh, the virus. They chimerize these. That means you make it into a human IgG structure. Everything but the combining site will be humanized so that when you put these in people, you won't get an antibody response against a mouse monoclonal. Uh, and they make these in tobacco plants. So it's very cheap and you can make large quantities. And, and this is just a picture of three different monoclonals uh, binding to the spike glycoprotein in white of Ebola virus. You see they have different specificities. Mon these monoclonals were experimental, they still are, and at the beginning of the Ebola outbreak, they were used famously in a few patients. We don't even know if they worked or not, but many other companies now have made improved versions, and presumably if we have another outbreak, or when we have another outbreak, uh, we'll be able to, to stop it very quickly. Now, in my view, this is the really the coolest example of passive therapy, which happened back in the 60s. You remember, my favorite book is Fever. This got me to be a virologist by reading it after I'd graduated from college. It's a story of the emergence of Lassa virus in Nigeria. And one of the first people who got sick in Nigeria was this nurse, Penny Pinio. And she recovered, remarkably, because we didn't give her any vaccine or antiviral. She just happened to recover on her own. And then the virus, of course, was brought over to the US. Um, actually, so she was, she was airlifted from Nigeria to Columbia Presbyterian Hospital, where she was cared for and she got better. But she, they just put her on a plane next to everybody else because back then we didn't have any kind of containment. Nowadays, you'd be in a plastic tent and isolated and so forth. She, reco she re recovered at Columbia. Of course, they had her serum there stored away. Uh, Jordi Casals was a virologist at Yale. He was working with the virus. He happened to live in Manhattan and he commuted to Yale every day. He infected himself uh, in the lab and they put him in Columbia Presbyterian and they gave her, they gave him her serum because she had antibodies to the virus and he survived as, as a consequence. Um, and these individuals have both since died, but it's a really cool story, which is uh, recounted in that book. All right, so a vaccine now. We're gonna talk the rest of this, uh, this session about vaccines, active vaccines. Uh, and here are some requirements. You have to make the right immune response. You may remember we talked about Th1 versus Th2 responses when DCs present antigens in the lymph node to lymphocytes. And that's slightly different for each virus. So your vaccine has to mimic whatever the Th response, whether it's an antibody predominant or a cellular predominant response. And that's often we don't know this for many viruses. Uh, you have to be protected against the disease. So it's not good enough that you make antibodies against the vaccine. You have to be protected. And you can only find that out in a clinical trial where you have people who are at risk of infection. So right now we have several Ebola vaccine candidates. We can't test any of them at the moment because there's no Ebola in the world. And we have to wait for the next outbreak to know if they will actually be protective. And we also have other requirements between those immunological ones. They have to be safe, of course, minimal side effects. If you have high side effects, people won't like them. They have to in induce uh, immunity in a population of individuals. It has to be long lasting. Unfortunately, some of our vaccines that we use, particularly the flu vaccine in old people is not long lasting. It has to be cheap. WHO's standard is less than a buck a dose, so they can give it to lots and lots of countries. Genetically stable, we'll talk about an example of that today. Storage, many vaccines have to be frozen, which is a big problem. This is rapidly changing with new technologies. And how it's delivered. Again, most vaccines up until today are injected by needle. That's costly, and you need someone who knows how to use a needle, a trained healthcare personnel. Obviously, if you could do oral uh, administration, this would be a lot better. And this is where one way that vaccines are going, yes. That is the cold chain, well, yes. Why do they have to be frozen? Well, viruses are labile, pretty much. They, they fall apart at your body temperature. But in most of the countries where they're needed, it's really hot. So it's 100 degrees, and these things sit, they come off an airplane, they sit on the tarmac, and they degrade. So you have to freeze them. And you know, WHO has developed kerosene-fired freezers that they put on the back of horses and deliver to remote areas to keep them cold. But that's old technology, and as you'll see, 
in a bit, we now can make vaccines that don't need a cold chain anymore. There are a number of ways you can make a vaccine. They're, they're summarized on this slide. And we're going to talk about some examples of most, but not all of these. You start with a virus that causes a disease. You identify a medical need for a vaccine. And then you can take that virus and do a number of things to it to make vaccines. You can just uh, make an infectious vaccine. You genetically alter the virus to make it not able to cause disease. We call this attenuation. And you end up with replication competent natural virus vaccines. You can inactivate infectivity. It's an inactivated virus vaccine. These don't replicate. You can fractionate it, break it up into components and purify them and inject those into an individual. And then on the right are all different technologies in, enabled by recombinant DNA, the ability to clone genes, amplify them in bacterial plasmids, produce proteins, and so forth. So you could uh, clone parts of the virus or the entire virus. Um, in fact, there are some DNA vaccines where you're injected with DNA, plasmid DNA, a circular DNA that, that encodes a gene of the virus. It's injected into your muscle, and you actually, the DNA is taken, taken up by antigen-presenting cells, and they're very efficient at making an immune response. So some of the uh, trial vaccines now are DNA-based vaccines. So that's easy. You just make DNA. You don't have to purify a protein or a virus. Sometimes you can put the gene in a different virus vector, uh, you can put a Ebola virus glycoprotein in vesicular stomatitis virus. That's one of the vaccines against Ebola that's being tested. We'll talk about using viruses as vectors at the end of this course. Uh, you can also produce proteins of individual proteins of the virus. You can then purify them and inject them. Or sometimes ex producing a single capsid protein leads to the assembly of a capsid. And we call that a virus-like particle vaccine because there's no genome in it. We'll look at examples of, of these today. So at the moment in the US, these are all the viral vaccines that are licensed. Uh, some of these are just for special occasions, for the military, for example. Uh, people who travel, hepatitis A, yellow fever vaccine, or for travelers, if you're going somewhere where the disease is present, you get, you get the vaccine. Others are childhood vaccines. Uh, such as um, a measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, all given together, polio vaccine, uh, hepatitis B for a universal in children. So many of these are, are universal, and many of those are required for entrance uh, into school. And interestingly, we have one here, which is given to people 60 years uh, of age of older. So we have quite a few different vaccines. This, these range in they're, they're attenuated infectious vaccines. They're virus-like particle vaccines or uh, individual proteins, and we'll uh, look at some of these today. So first we'll look at inactivated vaccines. Again, these, you take an infectious virus, you treat it with a chemical, formalin propiolactone detergent that either breaks it up or changes the proteins in a way so the virus is no longer infectious. So no infectivity, um, but you still have antigenicity. That is the proteins when injected into a person will give rise to antibodies or cells that are needed to protect against infection. And these typically have to be uh, injected. So let's look at an example or two of inactivated vaccines. Poliomyelitis, a disease very common until, in, in the US anyway, the <laughs> 1980s. And this is a quote from a 1959 textbook of medicine, a common acute viral disease characterized by a febrile illness with sore throat, headache, and vomiting. Many cases, a lower neuron paralysis develops. So 1% of the infections, remember, in polio, you get uh, paralysis. If you look in a medical textbook today, I do not think you will find uh, poliomyelitis. It's about to be eradicated. At one point in the US, 20 to 30,000 paralytic cases a year. Hospitals were full of iron lungs because people often lost the ability to breathe in addition to not, uh, the, the uh, loss of a leg or an arm. Uh, mo mo motion in the leg or the arm. Hospitals were full of these and people were put in them, they're lying in them, and they would have their breathing done for them until they could recover. Most individuals could recover with, with the proper therapy, and nowadays there are no more of these. You can find them in some museums, uh, but no longer in hospitals. Um, poliovirus, of course, is a virus with a plus-stranded RNA genome. It has a capsid uh, protein protecting the genome here, and there's no envelope uh, in the virus particle. Now, the most famous victim is probably Franklin Roosevelt. He had polio as a young man. He wasn't able to walk without assistance. He had leg braces. He moved around in a wheelchair. And this man was president of the United States, elected four times. 
amazing. Um, he uh, started a fundraising foundation called the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis. And he had kids send in dimes to the White House. It was called the March of Dimes. And just by doing that, he raised enough money, millions of dollars, to fund the development of the two polio vaccines that we use today. And one of them is an activated polio vaccine uh, developed by Jonas Salk. And this, you take polio and you treat it with formalin. It's no longer infectious, but when you inject it into people, you get protective antibodies. Uh, this was subjected to an amazing clinical trial in 1954, again, sponsored by the National Foundation, paid for by dimes that kids sent into the White House. 1.8 million children, the biggest clinical trial ever done and probably the biggest that will ever be done in the future. Uh, it was shown to be over 50% protective and it was licensed uh, the day after these results were announced, 12th April 1955. And these were the headlines in New York City. Polio was a big deal. And you look at these headlines in the various newspapers. There's Jonas Salk and so forth. Now, a few weeks after this vaccine was released, a number of kids who received it started getting paralyzed. And this was because one of the companies that was producing this vaccine, uh, Cutter Laboratories, wasn't following Salk's protocol properly and there was some inactivated virus left in the preparation. This was sorted out very quickly and vaccination was resumed. But this whole story is very interesting. And this story really led to the first product litigation law in this country. It's all documented in this wonderful book, The Cutter Incident by Paul Offit. Paul Offit is a pediatrician at, at Penn who's developed some vaccines of his own. And so from that day, there was a, a lawsuit surrounding this Cutter incident, very, very famous. And so many of the product liability uh, traditions that we still have today started uh, back then. But it was all because the virus was not completely inactivated. So now we do, this, we do this by the book and this is no longer a problem. So if you inactivate the virus properly, it's not an issue. So this vaccine works uh, by inducing antibodies in your blood. We know from many studies that what we call the correlative protection is neutralizing antibodies in the serum. That means uh, antibodies, if you have antibodies against polio, you would be protected against infection. So remember that you acquire polio by ingesting the virus by fecal oral contamination. It replicates the mucosal surfaces of your gut. It then proceeds to the blood uh, and in 1% of people it gets into the CNS and causes paralysis. The inactivated polio vaccine is injected and gives rise to antibodies in the blood. So once the virus reaches the blood, they are neutralized by the antibodies and that's how you're protected against infection. And the use of this vaccine uh, uh, introduced in 1955 brought down the cases of polio in the U.S. from 20 to 30,000 a year to about two or 3,000 in the 1960s. We then switched to a different vaccine, an infectious vaccine uh, in the 60s, and we'll talk about uh, that in a moment. Now, one of the key points here, which is very interesting, your gut remains susceptible to polio when you get IPV. IPV does not, does not produce mucosal antibodies, which is what you would need to prevent the virus from replicating in your gut. So if you're immunized with IPV and you ingest polio virus, it will replicate in your gut and you will shed it potentially infecting any other people who are not infected. And a couple of years ago in Israel, a country where they had switched to IPV uh, immunization of the whole population, it was shown that strains were coming in from other countries where the virus was still circulating, replicating in the intestines of, of people in Israel who had been immunized with IPV, and found, they found them in the sewers. And so this is one of the negatives of using uh, IPV. Another good example of an inactivated vaccine is influenza virus vaccine. Here's influenza virus, you've seen it many times. RNA virus with a segmented negative strand genome. It's enveloped, it has two glycoproteins, HA, two major glycoproteins, HA and NA, uh, in the envelope. Uh, and it occurs in three types, A, B, and C. And we immunize against types A and B. Only type C seems to cause minor or, or no illness. Now in the US, we typically have anywhere from 3,000 to 49,000 deaths caused by influenza virus. These are typically in very young or very old people. So it's a lethal virus, and that's why we have a vaccine against it. 
The vaccine is made in a number of different ways. The original flu vaccine was grown in embryonated chicken eggs. It was then taken out of the egg, inactivated with formalin or detergent, and then that is injected uh, into your arm. And we manufacture about 100 million doses every year of this vaccine in the US. It's about 60% effective at preventing uh, influenza. So out of 100 people who get the vaccine, you know, 40 of them are, are still susceptible to infection. People over 65, it's even less effective. And it doesn't even last more than one season in people who are over 65 years of age. So this is a vaccine where we need more work uh, on it. And protection correlates with antibodies against the glycoproteins on the surface of the particle, the HA and the neuraminidase. Now, if you have an allergy to feathers or chicken proteins, your doc will say you shouldn't get this vaccine. And you can instead get a cell culture grown vaccine uh, called flu cell vax. There are now others on the market as well. So there's no excuse for anyone to not be getting a flu vaccine anymore. Now the problem with influenza is that, as we will see when we talk about evolution, it varies from year to year. And the envelope proteins change each year, and sometimes they change enough so that the vaccine we used last year doesn't work anymore for the new strain. And so we have to be able to very quickly make new flu vaccine strains. So what has been developed is a very interesting system where we use re uh, viruses that grow really well in eggs, and then when a new strain arises, we take the HA and the NA genes of that new strain and we reassort them into this laboratory high growing strain. And then we can have a vaccine that grows well very quickly. This is done because typically a clinical isolate doesn't grow well uh, in chicken eggs without a lot of extra work. So every year uh, a reassortant is made if necessary to make a new vaccine. And this is the current vaccine, if you're interested. It has an A uh, strain, two A strains, an H1N1 and an H3N2. These are antigenic components of the surface proteins. And there are two uh, B components as well. And again, sometimes these aren't changed from year to year depending on how the virus is changing. Now you may wonder, how do we know if the virus is changing. Well, the World Health Organization, in collaboration with national laboratories like the CDC, has a huge surveillance network. They have thousands of laboratories everywhere that get samples from people who have flu. They isolate virus, they, they type the virus, and they see how that virus reacts with antibodies induced by the current vaccine. And this is an ongoing project continuously because you know the northern and southern hemispheres have winters at different times and flu is typically a winter disease. So here is an example of this process. WHO starts in January by looking at all the data that they've collected for the previous months, what strains are circulating, how they react with antibodies, and then by February they have to say, okay, these are going to be the components of this season's vaccines. They make reassortants with the egg high yielding strain. Uh, they do a variety of standardization and potency tests. They're licensed, packaged, and by September, you have the vaccine produced. You can't have it before then because this whole process takes a long time. And typically you start immunizing people for the winter, which flu will typically begin in November or December. So this is a really long, expensive process and it needs to be revised, obviously. Now, where does the virus change? There are two kinds of change. One of them is called antigenic drift, which is a year-to-year -year affair. And the virus, remember, uh, has two glycoproteins, HA and NA, and the HA is shown here on this slide. And the colored regions at the top are where the changes usually occur. These are epitopes. These are sequences on the HA that bind neutralizing antibodies. And you just need a one amino acid change in these epitopes to, to knock out the ability of antibodies induced by a vaccine uh, to bind. And so this is antigenic drift caused by error-prone RNA replication, as we'll see in a couple of uh, weeks. There are other more conserved residues uh, on the stem of this HA, shown in purple and red, and these, these don't change very much. And right now we're trying to make vaccines directed against these epitopes with the idea that we could make a universal flu vaccine that you would take maybe once or twice in your lifetime and would hit uh, every influenza virus strain. That would really, really be good. We'd eliminate having to make a new vaccine every year, eliminate all this surveillance. Um, and uh, I think that will probably happen within the next 10 years or so. 
The next question is, which statement about inactivated viral vaccines is wrong? Chemicals can be used to inactivate infectivity. They do not replicate. They can be dangerous if inactivation is not complete. Antigenic variation can make them ineffective or none of the above are incorrect. Well, only about half of you got the right answer, which is none of the above are incorrect. Every one of these is right. Chemicals can be used to inactivate. I just gave you a couple of examples of that. They do not replicate. Inactivated vaccines, by definition, don't replicate. They can be dangerous if an inactivation is not complete. The Cutter incident was an example of that. And antigenic variation can make them ineffective. And that's what happens with influenza virus. So none of them are wrong. All right, subunit vaccines. This is where you either take a virus, you break it up into bits, purify them and inject the bits, or you clone the gene of a particular viral antigen, produce it in a heterologous system, and you can either make individual proteins or uh, empty capsids. And we'll uh, give a couple of examples of these. So usually for this, you use a capsid or a membrane protein. An example for influenza is a relatively new vaccine called flu block. Great name, right? <laughs> so creative. Uh, and what we do here is you take the gene encoding the hemagglutinin glycoprotein, which is very important for neutralizing antibodies to be directed against, and you produce it in insect cells using an insect virus vector. So baculoviruses are insect viruses, and um, this is an insect cell. And you can get very high level protein production. It's very easy to do this. And so you infect insect cells. And you do this in huge fermenters like this one. It's full of infected cells. So you can make lots and lots of infected cells. Uh, you, can, you don't need serum in the medium. So that's a big expense using uh, cow serum or some other sort of serum. Uh, and then you purify the HA protein uh, and formulate it with phosphate buffered saline. Within two months, you can have a vaccine. So this is a very nice system for making vaccine quickly, a lot faster than making reassortants and so forth for the uh, other vaccine. Here's another interesting subunit vaccine. And here in this case, very much like flu, we express or we produce a single protein in cells. But for hep B, that single protein assembles into a virus-like particle. So it's a hepatitis B virus uh, vaccine. It's a cancer vaccine. Remember, hep B causes liver cancer in, in many people. And what's done is to produce a single protein, the hepatitis B surface antigen protein in yeast. It assembles into empty particles. So on the left is the complete virus. And remember, it has a, a gapped double-stranded DNA genome. It's got an icosahedral uh, shell surrounding it, and it's enveloped. And uh, these are the proteins embedded in the envelope. And if you produce just the proteins by themselves, they form a variety of particles of different shapes, but they're, they don't contain DNA. So they're not infectious, yet they are immunogenic, and they protect against infection. Another really good one are the human papillomavirus vaccines. Now, there are hundreds of human papillomaviruses that cause all kinds of warts all over your body. And uh, there are some called high-risk serotypes that are associated with various cancers, uh, cervical cancers, penile cancers, uh, anal cancer, and oral cancers as well. And we have three vaccines produced by different companies which have different serotypes, high-risk serotypes uh, in them. And again, these are serotypes associated with cancers. So many of the serotypes are not associated with cancers, but these are. And in these, we simply produce a single a viral protein in cell culture. This has been done in yeast uh, or in insect cells. The single viral protein assembles into an empty capsid spontaneously, uh, and it's purified, and you're injected with that virus-like particle vaccine. It induces antibodies, which then protect mucosal surfaces uh, from infection. Now, if you are sexually active, you should get this vaccine. Thousands of people die every year in the US from these various types of cancers. And um, this will prevent it. So there's really no reason not to get this vaccine. Um, you will transmit these viruses by sexual activity. In fact, the oral cancers are transmitted by oral sex in both male and female. And this vaccine will prevent those cancers. So if you haven't got this vaccine, you should really get it. It will save your life. And it hurts a little bit, as you'll see, 
there's adjuvant in this vaccine, so you get inflammation, but that's good. That means your immune cell, uh, system is responding. But all my kids got this. I remember going to the nurse and my son says, why am I getting this? And the nurse said, your father will tell you. <laughs> so I told him. Here's a couple of um, experimental ideas for vaccines. And one is really cool for flu vaccines, is to make virus-like particles in plants. So it turns out that if you produce the, the HA alone in certain cells, you actually get a particle. You will drive budding of a particle that just has HA in it. It's made of a membrane with no RNA and the HA, and they turn out to be very immunogenic. And these are in clinical trials at the moment. This is what it looks like in this picture. So this has been done in plants. So you can, it's actually done in tobacco plants because it's very easy to engineer tobacco plants. And a square meter of these plants will make 20,000 doses of vaccine, about 20 cents a dose. This is fabulous technology, which I think will be coming to market uh, in the next five years. And one of the reasons I think it's really cool is because you can do this quickly. So here's an example. Let's say a brand new influenza strain emerges. This is called a pandemic strain that we've never seen before. We'll talk about how these emerge a bit later, but these strains will spread globally and nobody has any immunity to them. We've never seen them before. So how do you get a vaccine produced in time? The last flu pandemic started in 2009. And by the time we had an egg-based vaccine supply, which takes about six months, so you can identify the strain and get an egg-based vaccine going, it takes you six months to do that, there was already a wave of pandemic illness, that red curve here. So we missed it with the first round. But a plant-based synthetic vaccine could be ready in four months or so in time for that first wave. All you need is the sequence of the HA. You then code it into a expression plasmid for plants and you can make your vaccine. So I think this and similar types of uh, very rapid vaccines are gonna have uh, really a place in the future flu vaccine armamentarium. There are pluses and minuses about subunit vaccines. So they use recombinant DNA technology so you can do lots of manipulation. There's no genome of the virus, there's no infectious virus, so it's in theory safe. However, they tend to be expensive, they're new technology, uh, and they're expensive because the companies have to recover their development costs. Typically, they have to be injected, all right? And they're, they're really poorly antigenic. If you think about it, they're not replicating, right? So we have to get over these issues. And so here's something that will reach back to what you learned uh, a few weeks ago. If something is not replicating, you don't send a danger signal. There's no inflammation because their cells are not dying and releasing viral proteins, which can be picked up by the dendritic cells. These are just protein subunit vaccines, so they don't replicate, and you don't get a great adaptive response. So what we do in some cases, we add adjuvants. These are chemicals that we add to the vaccine, and that's why when you get an HPV vaccine, your arm is pretty sore for a few days. You have a raised a bump on your skin where you've had the vaccine. It's red, it's painful, and it's warm. All the signs of inflammation because we put a, an adjuvant in it that causes inflammation and that makes you get a good antibody response. Otherwise, you wouldn't get a great antibody response to these vaccines. So adjuvants work in a number of ways. They, um, st they stimulate these early processes. They stimulate inflammation and the interaction of DCs with lymphocytes and you can use less antigen as a consequence. There's also some contribution when you, when you mix the uh, viral antigen with an adjuvant, it tends to allow slow release of the antigen from the injection site, and of course it causes inflammation. Now here are two uh, used uh, adjuvants that are used. Uh, one of them is used in the HPV vaccine in the US. It's, it's aluminum hydroxide or phosphate. Um, AS4 is used in one of the HPV vaccines, and this is a ligand for TLR4. It's shown up here. It's actually mimicking a component of the bacterial outer cell wall, which is a great TLR4 ligand. What is TLR4? It's an innate sensor. It senses this adjuvant, and you get great inflammation. You're, you're making cytokines, you're attracting dendritic cells into the area, and they're picking up uh, bits of this vaccine. Another one is called MF59, which is licensed in Europe. It's a squalene oil and water emulsion, and it also has uh, innate stimulatory activity. So 
it's very interesting that as we understand the contribution of the innate response to adaptive responses, these adjuvants come into play and make a lot of sense. Another cool technology, two more cool technologies here. Remember I said a big issue with a lot of vaccines is that they have to be injected. Not every vaccine lends itself to oral ingestion like the polio and rotavirus and forthcoming norovirus vaccines. But there is a better way than a needle and it's called the microneedle patch. These are tiny plastic synthetically made patches with very, very small needles on one side and they're stuck on your skin with a Band-Aid the needles go into your dermal tissues where there are lots of antigen presenting cells and they're, they're soaked with the vaccine. So the vaccine gets put into your dermal tissues slowly and they, they work really well for a variety uh, of viruses. And of course, you don't have to know how to use a needle to put these on. They don't hurt. So this is gonna, you're going to see these coming out in the future. And the thermal stability issue is addressed brilliantly by thermostabilization with either silk or sugar. Turns out that silk is amazingly thermostabilizing for proteins. And the silk itself can be mixed with a vaccine. It makes a polymer, which is incredibly stable to heat. Uh, you can also do the same with sugars of various sorts. You can simply dry the vaccine in a sugar formulation, and it's incredibly stable. So here, for example, is a inactivation curve of measles vaccine. And we're incubating this at 45 Celsius for up to 25 weeks. You can see the vaccine by itself uh, loses all its potency within 10 weeks or so. It's totally non-infectious. If you use this, it would be worthless as a vaccine because measles is an infectious vaccine. And look at the top. We've added uh, a sugar in this case to stabilize it. 45 degrees for 25 weeks. It's almost completely still potent. It's amazing. And again, this is going to be making its way to market very soon. Really remarkable stuff. I mentioned universal flu vaccines. Uh, one of the ways that this is being done is instead of giving people a, a, a broken virus particle vaccine where you have the entire HA protein present, the, the head of the HA tends to be immunodominant. You make most antibodies against it. And that's exactly the part of the protein that varies from year to year. So what if we could immunize people with the stem region, which has conserved epitopes that don't change from year to year. So people are experimenting with making headless HAs. The idea being that we can focus the immune response on this stem, the antibodies produced will be neutralizing, and they won't have to be uh, replaced from year to year. So that is another one that I think you will see. Perhaps in your lifetimes, you will have Universal flu vaccines where you only have to have one and it will protect you against any strain that could possibly uh, emerge at, at any time. Really, really remarkable stuff. What are some requirements for an effective vaccine? Low cost, ease of administration, provides long lasting immunity, minimal side effects or all of the above. It's 200% two, it's two, now, that's the new record that will be hard to match in future years. All right, good job, they're all right. Let's look at attenuated vaccines. These are infectious virus vaccines. You, you take them, either injection or orally, and they replicate in you. You take the parental virulent virus, you do something to it, and the something is what the magic is, what we'll talk about. You make it what we call attenuated or avirulent. It doesn't cause disease, but it still replicates and you get an immune response. So the idea is these are nice because they're self-amplifying. These inactivated vaccines that we've talked about, typically you need a couple of doses. You know, the papilloma vaccines, you need three doses. You get a little immune response initially, and then the second dose you get a little more, and the third dose finally you have a protective level of antibodies. But a, an attenuated vaccine replicates with one shot and you get amplification of the virus and an amplified immune response. So in theory, it's just mimicking a natural infection, basically. And if you can get a virus that doesn't cause disease but will replicate, this is a nice vaccine to have. So these are, these, up until today, these kinds of vaccines have been derived empirically. That is, we take a virulent virus, here we have a human pathogenic virus, and let's say we grow it in different cells. We grow it in monkey cells, and we go from cell to cell to cell, until the virus doesn't replicate well in human cells anymore, enough though to, to cause uh, induction of antibody responses, but not to cause disease. So this is what I mean by empirical. 
you pass the virus, and at each step you test it for virulence in an animal model, and when you have something you think is good, you go into people and do clinical trials. So one example of this is what I think is the best flu vaccine that we have right now. It's called flu mist. It is a replication competent vaccine. It's sprayed into your nose. Person has the, the, the vaccine in a little syringe without the needle, right? Just the a needleless syringe. They put it in your nose, they squeeze it, it goes into your upper tract and replicates. And, and this mimics a flu infection, but you don't get sick. So I think this is the best vaccine. If you ever have a choice, take this one. Problem is that there's only one company that makes it so far and they don't make a whole lot. Uh, this is also made by reassortants. They have a master strain that they reassort every year, if necessary, with the currently circulating HA and NA genes. Now, these viruses were selected in the laboratory to be cold adapted, which means they prefer to replicate in the upper tract rather than the lungs, which is warmer. They can't replicate down there. They are temperature sensitive, so they don't like to replicate in the lower tract. And in animals, they didn't cause disease. So they were then uh, given clinical trials in people and shown to be safe and immunogenic. They only replicate in your upper tract and they produce uh, protective immunity. The other infectious attenuated vaccine I want to talk about are another polio vaccine. We call these the Sabin oral poliovirus vaccines. And you ingest these. You take them by drinking a little bit of virus. They go into your intestinal tract. And just like a, a polio infection, they replicate in the mucosa. Uh, they get into the blood, but they don't go into the central nervous system. So you don't get paralytic disease, but you're immunized. Um, so OPV will immunize not only your intestinal surfaces, but also your blood as well. Whereas remember, IPV only immunizes uh, the blood and not the mucosal surfaces. So as I said, we discontinued an activated vaccine in the early 60s. We replaced it with the oral vaccine and that eliminated uh, polio from the US. No more polio in the US. Now, how are these made? Again, these are empirically derived vaccines. Albert Sabin took one of each of the three serotypes. There are three serotypes of polio you need to immunize against. And he passed it in different kinds of animals and cells. You can see monkeys, chimps, uh, monkey kidney cells, and so forth. And at every passage, he would take a little virus and put it in an animal model, which would be a monkey, and see if it were paralyzing. And if, if it did paralyze him, he would move on and pass it some more until he finally arrived with three strains called the Sabin type 1, 2, and 3 strains. And, you know, interestingly, the first thing he did was he gave these viruses to his wife and daughters. Because in the old days when you made a vaccine, that's what you did. Salk did the same thing. He tested it on his kids. You can't do this anymore, of course. This is called medical ethics. Um, but back then, people used to test their vaccines, and so his wife and, children, and daughters were fine. You then move into larger studies, and you know, unfortunately, the, the way it was done was then to move into prisoners who don't have much of a choice, and you give them these vaccines and test it on them. And that's another thing we can't do anymore, which is fine. And then move into larger and larger clinical trials. So these were licensed in 1961. What are they? In the 80s, we attained the ability to sequence viral genomes, and we found that Sabin's three strains have very few mutations that make them attenuated. There are five in the type 1 and two each in the types 2 and 3. And you can see they all have a mutation in the 5' prime non-coding region. He didn't know anything about this. He, these vaccines were licensed before you could ever sequence a gene or a genome. But we found this out in the 80s. And nowadays, if you tried to license these vaccines, the FDA would say they're too similar to the wild type virus. Go back and make more mutations. So these mutations are in the five prime non-coding region of the viral RNA, which is an internal ribosome entry site. And they're all located in uh, stem loop five on the upper left. And that's expanded on the right here. You can see the type one, type two, and type three Mutations. These are the ones in the 5' prime UTR that are very important for the ability of this virus to be attenuated. Now, these mutations revert very rapidly after the virus is ingested and replicates in your intestine. And this was a very early experiment done in 1985 by a British Pocorna virologist, Phil Miner. He and his wife had a kid, and they thought, ah, oh, let's sequence all the polioviruses that are shat out by our kid. And so every day he would bring diapers to the lab and they would sequence the virus that was present. So David Miner, 
uh, had received polio vaccine, Sabin vaccines, and this is just the type three sequence at U72. The vaccine has a U, and you can see within 35 hours, the U begins to revert to the virulent sequence, and by two days, David is, is shedding uh, viruses with a C, and you put these in a monkey model, they are pathogenic. So this is a number that measures the uh, paralytogenic property of the virus. You can see the vaccine is very low, uh, and this is certainly not a vaccine. Turns out that everybody who gets this vaccine, it reverts in their intestines. So this is a property of the vaccine, which we shouldn't worry about. Well, it turns out that there is a low rate of vaccine-associated paralysis associated with getting this vaccine, about one paralytic case per 1.4 million doses. In other words, one out of one and a half million kids who get this vaccine get paralyzed. And in the US, you can see the curve here. This is the reported cases of, of polio in the US. The line is the total number of cases. So in the early 60s, there were still cases of polio caused by circulating wild type virus. But the gray bars are the vaccine associated cases of polio, seven to 80 a year in the US. And eventually we had no wild polio, the last outbreak in 1979. Every case of polio for 20 years was caused by the vaccine. So that's no longer acceptable in the US. So we switched in 2000 to IPV and now there's no more polio because we, the vaccine isn't causing it. But this vaccine, the OPV is still being used globally uh, in the eradication effort. So WHO declared in 1988, we're gonna eradicate polio and eventually stop immunizing. We are almost there, we're behind schedule. This brings up an interesting question. Can you eradicate a viral disease? And we have only eradicated one, smallpox, which is a very, very bad virus infection, which uh, leaves people deformed like this and also can kill you 30% of the time. It was eradicated in 1978. There are two features you need to eradicate a virus. It can only have one host and vaccination induces lifelong immunity. One host meaning humans and not animals. It can't also have an animal host. And polio fits the bill. That's why we are on the, in the midst of an eradication campaign. So with polio, we went from about 400,000 cases a year in 1988, uh, 10 years later, um, restricted to very specific regions in red. 2008, uh, Nigeria, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and here's the situation today. This is truly remarkable. Only in uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan have we been unable to eradicate wild type polio. It's gone from everywhere else. So these red dots are cases of wild type polio. Unfortunately, we're using Sabin vaccine, so we get cases of vaccine associated polio. You can see the purple dots here. Uh, and, and these countries are cases of vaccine associated polio type one. We also see the same with polio type two. Now, polio type two has been eradicated from the globe. We haven't seen it for over five years. And so the plan now this month, April, is to stop using OPV type two, because as long as we use OPV type two, we keep getting vaccine associated disease. And eventually we'll do the same for type three, which is almost, we haven't seen type three in a few years either. What's left is type one. And when type one is gone, we stop uh, immunizing. Now, I just wonder, these vaccine-derived viruses continue to circulate for long periods of time. I'm a little worried that if we stop immunizing newborns at all, that we're going to have an outbreak. Now, WHO recognizes this, and they've said, well, get some IPV ready uh, to, in case of an outbreak. But, you know, a lot of countries can't afford to do that. So what happens should be uh, really interesting. So here are the numbers. So far in 2016, nine cases of wild polio, three of vaccine-derived polio, and in total in 2015, 74 cases of wild polio, and that's just in Pakistan and Afghanistan, and 32 cases of vaccine-derived polio. So we have to stop using this vaccine, which is really interesting. It's the vaccine that's eradicated polio from most of the globe, and we, we have to stop using it because it causes polio. But if you eradicate a virus, it's still around because the sequences are all out there. And you know, you can make you can take a sequence on PubMed and have it synthesized and put that DNA into cells and you get virus back. We've talked about that a long time ago. So you can eradicate polio, but someone could always reconstruct it. So you have to be ready, which is really unfortunate. We have to have stockpiles of vaccines and be ready in case someone makes polio or smallpox or some other virus uh, that's been eradicated and wants to reintroduce it into the world.
I want to close now by considering a kind of attenuated vaccine which uses recombinant DNA technology. So all the vaccines, all the attenuated vaccines I've talked to you about, the flu mist, uh, the, the OPV, these were made empirically by hit and miss. And I want to tell you a story about how you can use recombinant DNA to engineer vaccines now. Now this story begins with the yellow fever virus, the first human virus identified in 1901. It's a flavivirus virus transmitted by Aedes aegypti. It's a big outbreak right now in Angola, as a matter of fact. Uh, the disease ranges from a mild fever, nausea, to uh, failure of major organs, including the liver. People get jaundiced, they turn yellow, and that's where the name flavy or yellow fever comes from. So a vaccine was produced. So th this virus was present extensively in many tropical countries for years. It even reached as far north as Boston uh, in the U.S. It was imported into the U.S. by the slave trade and spread all the way up to Boston until winter came and killed all the mosquitoes. Um, while they were building the Panama Canal, it was wiping out all the workers, and that's in fact what led to identification of the mosquito vector and the virus itself. So a vaccine was produced in 1938 by Max Tyler working at the Rockefeller Institute in New York City. He took a wild-type strain, it's called the SCB strain, he passed it 176 times in chicken embryos. 176 times, you figure, a week per passage. He was a very patient guy, I suppose, but in the end, he got a virus and he had developed a mouse model for yellow fever. In the end, after all these passages, he got a virus that no longer killed the mice. So this was put into clinical trials, shown to be safe in people, and it's a really good vaccine. If you go to a yellow fever endemic country, you'll get this 17D vaccine. Over, over half a billion doses have been distributed so far. It's safe and it, pre and it prevents um, yellow fever. What do we do next with this? this? This is the genome of yellow fever virus. The RNA is shown as the green line. It's produced as a single polyprotein, which is cleaved, very much like the picornaviruses. And here on the left end are uh, the genes encoding two of the structural proteins, PRM and E. E is the glycoprotein shown in this diagram uh, in, the, in the putty color. And that's the protein against which neutralizing antibodies are made uh, as well as PRM, that little blue protein there. So what was done was to take this highly successful yellow fever vaccine, they made a DNA copy of the genome so they could manipulate it, they cut out the PRM and E sequences from yellow fever, and they put in the same genes from dengue virus. So dengue virus is also a flavivirus, big problem globally as we have discussed before, billions of people at risk for serious dengue disease. And people said, well, why not leverage this great yellow fever vaccine and use it to really quickly make a dengue vaccine? So that's what was done. There are four serotypes of dengue. So they made four recombinants of yellow fever vaccine, replacing the glycoproteins with those of dengue. So that's called Dengvaxia. It was just licensed recently. It's produced by Sanofi, a really large pharmaceutical company. Uh, as I said, it's the E and the PRM genes of dengue substituted in the yellow fever. So there, it's a tetravalent vaccine, four different serotypes. It's been licensed in three countries so far. Unfortunately, this vaccine doesn't protect against dengue type 2. It's been uh, studied in three different clinical trials. And for some reason, people who are immunized with uh, this vaccine over 95% of them make antibodies against dengue type 2, but when they're put in a situation where they get infected, they, they're not protected. It's a great example of how we, we don't actually understand what is protective for dengue. It's obviously not antibodies because it's not enough to prevent type 2 infection. Now, in a very long-term study, a three-year study, I think, follow-up, they found uh, in a group of individuals receiving either the vaccine or placebo, there was worse disease in kids two to nine years old in the group that got the vaccine. All right, so let me tell you that again. In the group that got this dengue vaccine from two to nine years of age, they had worse dengue illness than the unvaccinated control. So this obviously is not good for a vaccine. Nevertheless, it's, it's licensed because dengue is such a big issue. So the current vaccine is licensed in all age groups except two to nine years old. It's, it's uh, licensed in older kids, but this is unfortunate because there's a huge population in the world at risk for dengue infection which who are between two and nine years of age. So clearly we need something better. It turns out that the NIH 
here in the U.S. has been working on dengue vaccines for many, many years, for over 20 years. And their approach has been to do a dengue vaccine and not a recombinant vaccine. So they have made a, a vaccine called TV003, which is a tetravalent vaccine where they just take dengue virus, they make a DNA copy of it, and then they make mutants in the genome by chopping out pieces of DNA or changing amino acids. And they have studied dozens and dozens of candidates until they found some that are attenuated in animals, and then they put them in humans. And uh, one of the candidates, TV003, one dose gives you 100% protection. And they actually have done challenge studies. So this is really interesting. Most viruses, you can't challenge people. In other words, you can't immunize them and then infect them with the virus, right? That's not ethical. But it turns out that uh, one of their vaccine candidates, which didn't make it to the final cut, is attenuated enough that you can use it as a challenge virus. So they would immunize people with TV003 and wait a few weeks and then come back with this uh, attenuated vaccine candidate. 100% protection, one dose. This is great because Dengvaxia needs three doses injected. And this is really, really hard in the populations who are at risk uh, for dengue. Now, the reason I, I go through all of this is because very early in the Zika outbreak, uh, many companies were saying, we're going to make a Zika vaccine really quickly by putting the Zika glycoproteins into the yellow fever backbone. And we'll have it really fast, and it's going to work really well. And I don't think that's going to work because of this yellow fever dengue experience. I think they need to use Zika on its own and develop a vaccine like this. Now, you may ask, what was wrong with Dengvaxia? So here's what we think. You put the glycoproteins of dengue in a yellow fever backbone. You get antibodies against the glycoproteins, but that's not enough for protection. Turns out you need cellular immunity. And the epitopes, the proteins against which lymphocytes are directed, are not the glycoproteins. There are all these other non-structural proteins. Of course, in a dengue yellow fever vaccine, they're all yellow fever, so they do nothing to prevent a dengue infection. So here's a great example where we didn't really know what the correlates of protection for, for dengue were. We don't know the correlates for Zika virus either. It's, for yellow fever, these vaccines worked because we had the whole genome and all the viral proteins were being made. So we had a combination of antibody and cellular responses. So it turns out that you need to have a lot of these other viral proteins present to generate a really good cellular response. So we'll see going forward in the next year or two if uh, the companies who are working on Zika vaccine will actually heed these results with dengue, which just came out in the last few weeks or so, and make a real Zika vaccine, or will they take the shortcut, make a recombinant yellow fever Zika, which may not work? <laughs>